So we're here for the Career Lunch Speaker Series. And in that series, we showcase people with visual disabilities who have led exemplary lives in work and in their personal lives. Uh, the people that we talk to are extraordinary role models for our Career Lunch trainees, as well as the students uh, at large at Perkins School for the Blind and indeed for everyone. I'm really excited for the conversation that we have today. Um, today, we are speaking to two individuals who truly do exemplify all of those values. So with us today are John Bramblett and Kim Charlson. So let me tell you a little bit about both of them. John is an award-winning painter. John lost his vision in 2001 and decided to pick up a paintbrush as a way to reconnect with the visual world. Since then, John's work has been featured in major news outlets. He's worked with a number of celebrities, including Tony Hawk, Jeff Bridges, Lyle Lovett, and so many more. Uh, he is the number one ranked blind painter in the world and has received three presidential service awards. He's also been named a cultural ambassador to the United States. And uh, incidentally, one of his paintings is hanging in my house. So I am really excited <laughs> for today's conversation. Interviewing John today is Perkins' own Kim Charlson, the executive director of the Perkins Braille and Talking Book Library. In addition to her work at Perkins, Kim was the first female president of the American Council for the Blind. She's a globally recognized advocate for equal access for people with disabilities, and she serves on several committees for the Library of Congress's National Library Service for the blind and physically handicapped, and she serves as a member of the Braille Authority of North America. In 2019, the Association of Specialized Government and Cooperative Library Services awarded Kim the Francis Joseph Campbell Award in recognition of her leadership and commitment to inclusion and empowerment. And just this year, the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts presented Kim with a Leadership Exchange in Arts and Disability Award. That award recognized her work to expand access for the, to the arts for people who are visually impaired. So I know John and Kim will have a lot to talk about. It is my honor to have both of you with us today. And with that, Kim, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dina, and thank you to Career Launch. And I just want to acknowledge that I'm very honored to um, fill the role of interviewer for today's program. I'm stepping in for Brian Switzer, who is part of our Career Launch team, who was unable to be here today due to a death in the family. So. I'm happy to be able to step in and have the opportunity to meet John and be able to facilitate his, all of us getting to know him better. So welcome, John. And it's oh. great to have you as part of this presentation. Oh, thanks so much, Kim. And it is, it's such an honor to meet you. And I just wanted to say before we get started, thank you for all the things you've done. It's just it's just incredible. Oh my goodness. That's such an honor to chat with you. And, and, and Dina, thanks so much for the kind words you said. <laughs> That's so sweet. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to this. I can't, yeah, this, this is awesome. Well, John and I found out that we had a little um, Texas in common. Um, he's coming to you today from Denton, Texas. And um, I went to graduate school to get my library degree in Denton, Texas at the University of North Texas. So I surprised him when I sprung that little tidbit <laughs> on him because he didn't think he'd be meeting any any people with Texas ties today when he's talking to folks in New England. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a small world, isn't it? <laughs> it is more than we know, I think. So, well, I am so interested in learning more about your journey and you know how how you um, you know experienced your vision loss in 2001 and how you um, turned to art and most specifically painting mm -hmm. to, um, you know, as, as your um, venue for your creative thought, your experience and how that's evolved. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about the early days of your journey and kind of get us up to speed to all the different kinds of things you're doing now, which are incredible. Oh, oh, thanks so much, Kim. I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I had a lot of health problems when I was a kid and I had, I had kidney problems. I had neurological problems. I was born with ep epilepsy. Um, I had a kidney out by the time I was seven and I was just in and out of hospitals a lot. And, um, but I had a wonderful family. I had wonderful pe people around me and I had art. I, I love to draw and art is a great way of getting yourself, you know, out of, 
out of your own head. It's a great way to take a little vacation. So if you're having a bad day, art's a great way to that helps that day. And if you're having a good day, art's a great way to celebrate that day. So bad day or good day, I drew and I, I think I could draw before I could walk. I have a weird twisted brain where um, drawing just made sense. And I was sighted back then. But um, as, as, as we've well established, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a nerd. So <laughs> anything I'm interested in, I, I go full, full bore into it. So I read everything I could about art. I took every class I could. And by the time I started college, I, 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 could, I could work on the blueprints for a house. I could draw that. I could draw um, a portrait of a person. I could do car cartooning, anime, regular cartoons, all kinds of stuff. Anything drawing I was into. And then in college, though, um, I ended up losing my eyesight. And I thought, I thought I had lost everything, I, 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 including art. And I just felt like everything had gone away. I was really fortunate, though, because I was going to the University of North Texas, and they, they had a very proactive uh, Office of Disability Accommodations at the time. And I was already enrolled with them for the epilepsy. And, and then I found out I was losing my eyesight, and I thought I had to leave college. I thought everything was just over. And I went by the ODA, and Ron Venable was the director there then. And I said, well, Ron, I got to go. <laughs> I'm like, I'm losing my eyesight. So I was just telling everybody goodbye, basically. And he was like, John, you don't have to go anywhere. Like, you can do whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. The, the, the accommodations we have, the, the, the technology, the, the amount of just knowledge that's out there is just incredible. You know, you, you can do whatever you want. And I was so angry and I was so depressed. To be honest, I didn't really believe him. And I thought he was just being nice to me. I thought, oh, you know, what a nice guy <laughs> you know, to try to just to try to make me feel better. But he was just being honest. And um, so I was able to stay in school and I, I was getting incomplete in my classes while I was learning Braille and learning JAWS and, you know, other screen readers too. And, and um, all the stuff you have to learn. And, but one of the main things that I was learning was orientation and mobility. Um, and, you know, where you learn how to use a white cane, you learn how to space, spatially orient yourself. How to, how to get around by using your other senses. And then, you know, after about a year, I could leave my apartment and I could I, I could use my cane and I, I could travel. I, I lived really close to campus, but I could cross a couple of streets I needed to and get to campus, still sweating bullets because it was all really new, new to me, start traveling alone. And, um, but I thought, my goodness, if, if a person can use these techniques and be able to cross a, a town, and not get hit by a car or not knock over too many people <laughs> or something, then surely you could you could you could navigate something smaller like a canvas. So I started to use the art techniques that I that I I already knew and combining that with the orientation and mobility techniques. So I started to learn how to redraw again. And um it was very simple at first, like trying to draw squares and circles and um but that's what started it really was just combining the cane training with the art techniques that I knew before. So, um, and I was so angry and I was so depressed. And it, when I started this, the idea of a blind painter wasn't really a thought that people had. <laughs> it was, and I, I thought I was, this is like 21 years ago, 20 years ago, it was like, and I, I thought I was crazy. I thought I was out of my mind, but art had always helped me in the past. It was my way of dealing with bad things. And um, so I was just, I was just reaching out, trying to get anything that would help. and. The wonderful thing about art is that it puts you in the moment so that you're not able to think about anything else. You know, when you have paint on the end of your brush, you're thinking about that and where it needs to go for each little stroke. And you're not worried about the past. You're not concerned about the future. You're right there in the moment. And that's right where you need to be, you know, and so that it, it was it was a healing thing for me. It sounds like it, and and I can certainly say thank goodness for that. Um, your your um, disabled student service coordinator person at UNT for telling you that no, you don't have to give up school. There's ways to work with that. It's so important to have that one link where somebody says, "No, you don't have to stop. You can keep going." Okay, and especially you're so right, especially in career launch where you know, so many barriers are out there for people losing their vision and they might still be working. You know, they don't think there's any future. And, you know, one person saying, no, there are accommodations that can be made. Let's see if we can help keep you in the job rather than people saying, oh my gosh, I have to give it all up now. My, my life is over. Your life isn't over. So I'm so happy that Ron was there for you 
and I just hope there's going to be some Rons out there to help other people too. I, I do too. And that's, and that's a huge thing. It really is because I, I really thought my life was over. I thought, I thought there wouldn't be any new things in my life. And, but what I learned though, is that, you know, once, once, once you make the accommodations, once you learn the new techniques, then it's just life. You're just living life and you're just, you just have different ways to do things. Like I have different ways that I cook, you know, I have different ways that I get around. I have different ways that, that, that I do different things, but, but it doesn't make life any less good. <laughs> if That makes any Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. So as you decided to pick up art again and pick up the paintbrush, how did you evolve from squares on the canvas to other kinds of things on the canvas that that um, allowed you to progress? And you know, you're you're now world famous for being a blind painter. And you know, tell me a little bit about that. And people always refer to you as a, the blind painter, but you know, is that is that cool? Does it bother you? Are you a painter who's blind? How do you feel about about that element as well? And and kind of you know, Dina had a one of your paintings in her in her home. So your that's artwork awesome. is sold all over the world. So that's a big a big journey right there from squares yeah. to artwork that's sold all over the world. You know, I I feel I feel so blessed, and it, but I also feel like um I can't I can't believe it because when I, whenever I first started. I, I was painting and I was just trying to, to, to connect with people. And that, that, that was a big reason why I was painting because sometimes whenever you lose your eyesight, the sighted people around you don't, don't know what you understand anymore. They don't, you know, cause you know, it was like, it was like me. I didn't know anything about blindness when I first lost my eyesight, everything I knew I'd learned from TV and movies, which isn't the best place to get your information. Yeah. You know, somebody loses their eyesight in a movie and very often they walk around like, like they're Frankenstein or something, or, or a loved one will walk in the room. They're like, Oh, who are you? And you think, Oh, come on. You know, you know, you know, you know, your mom's voice, <laughs> you know, it's, exactly. it's just silly. And, and, but, but I wanted to reconnect with people and, but I wanted to paint because I wanted to show that, that I understood what was going on. And I thought if I could do that in a visual sort of way and drawing always had made sense to me in the past, but I thought if I could feel something or, or paint something and show that, Hey, I'm still in here. John's still in here. Then it would be a way to reconnect with people. And to be honest, I really, I really didn't think it would work. And I, and I really, really didn't think anybody would ever want to see a painting of mine. You know, if, I mean, why, why would they? I, I was just doing it because I was really depressed and angry. Even my first art shows, I didn't tell people that I was blind. I, 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 I did the show because I wanted to meet other artists, other people that were just as obsessed with art as I was. And I thought, well, that'd be a friend. So, well, you know, if you want to meet other artists, you need to go to an art show, you know, and do that. And then you'll meet other artists. And I was like, all right, let's do that. And um, so I wouldn't do a show opening because I didn't want anybody to know I was visually impaired. I didn't, I just wanted people to look at the paintings and not think about the artist. And the shows did really well. And, and then it got out that I was visually impaired and some stories were written. And that was the best thing that could happen to me because I was still very angry, very depressed. But I started to, to get reached out to by, by different nonprofits and charities saying, hey, um, can, can, you, can you come talk to our clients? Can you come talk to our people and, um, you know, talk about painting or maybe do a workshop or whatever. And so while I was still in college, I started traveling around and did, doing that. And I would meet soldiers that had PTSD. I would meet children with autism. I'd meet other people with visual impairments, all kinds of people that, that had different challenges in their lives. And I, I, you know, I was under the impression that the blindness had made me different than everyone else. You know, I felt very isolated, very alone, even though I had a wonderful family, wonderful people around me, amazing friends. I still felt very alone. But whenever I would go talk to the to these people that had these challenges in their lives, we were all like best friends. We, we all got each other, you know, immediately. And it was just the warmest, best feeling. And I, I just felt like this weight had been lifted. You know, these people understood, you know, that, what, you know, and they might have a different challenge, but we all got each other. And I started to realize that my vision loss, it didn't make me different than everyone else. It just made me more like everyone else. Everybody has something in their life that is just bigger than they are. And they might need a little bit of help with it, you know, and, and, and that started to help. And um, I mean, the work with the nonprofits and charities, museums were one, wanting to be more inclusive. And they heard about me doing the work with the nonprofits. So I said, hey, can you come and design some programs? Can you, you know, come paint at the museum? And so I started doing that and um, 
you know, and I've worked with the Guggenheim, the Met, worked with the Dallas Museum of Art, uh, dozens of museums all around the country, but it, it, I sort of fell backwards into that. So, you know, it's um, just because I just love painting and I love working with people and I love doing workshops. And um, so I don't know if I really answered the whole question. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a big question, but you said that you recently traveled to Boston to do some work. Can you tell us a little bit about what that trip entailed and what you did? Oh, let me think. Um, I was working, <laughs> let me see, I was working with the, um, with the Braille Press, I believe. Oh, and and the reason I'm, I'm wondering is because I, I, I just went off on yes. a trip where, where I went to um, um, Washington, D.C., and I, and I painted live at the, at the Kennedy Center. And that, and, that, and that was a trip that just me and my guide dog, Eagle, went on. So every once in a while we travel alone. Uh -huh. A lot of times I travel with my wife. But, um, but I love that the techniques that we have, the technology we have, makes it where a person who's visually impaired can travel. If you have a smartphone, a smart dog, you can do anything you want, yeah. <laughs> or even a cane. But I, I, love, I love the cane. But I, I have to say, I'm partial to my guide dog. She's she's a sweetheart. And um, but um, and then I went. For, gosh, like last in October, I was all over the place. I went to Boston, and I was doing that. And I did I did some workshops, and I did a talk. Um, oh, and I raised some money for. Um, I swear my brain, I, I'll have to look it up. And then <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. And then well, um, I know you were at National Braille Press. That that was yes. the trigger for me to remember that you had been here. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, that, and that was the gala. Yeah. Dude, yes, that's exactly. It was thing. a fundraising gala. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Thank you. So yes, yes, yes. That's exactly. And that was so much fun. Oh, my word. Yes. And I painted it now. And so I was painting there. And then we also did a workshop where we had some vi visually impaired children come in. And the gala mm -hmm. was so much fun. And and I got to meet so many wonderful people. And the reason there's a little bit of a blur because October, you know, it's, it's, it's Art Beyond Sight Month. It's, it's a lot of disability awareness. Mm -hmm. So I try to go to as many places as I, as I can. And, um, and it's always wonderful. And it's always like a marathon, it seems like, because I just want to, I don't know, I, I, most of the time I, I'm in my studio and I'm working. But if I get a chance to, to be around people, then I usually take it. <laughs> well, you were here in Boston for the a gala at National Braille Press, and tell tell us a little bit about you know how does Braille work into your life? You learned it later in life when you lost your vision, mm -hmm. um, but how does it? How do you use it today? Well, you know um, that's that's one of the things you know if you look in the history of of humanity, you you've never really had people who were blind getting into painting and the visual arts. I mean, vision is the very first word, so you think it's got to be pretty important. Um, there's been artists that were already painters that lost their eyesight. And you know, that there's found adaptations, but now for the first time in history, you have people that are visually impaired that are actually becoming visual artists. And I think the big reason for that is because the the access to information. You know, it's it said it said we can access. We have Braille. We have we have the computers, the technology that we have. We can read all all the articles. You know that 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 have been written. We can do all this. And so in my in my studio, all my paints are Braille, so that I know. Like, hear me. I'm gonna grab a paint. Oh my gosh. Okay. So this is an orange. I'm I'm really lazy. I gotta admit when I when I write with Braille. Uh -huh. So I only use the fewest letters that I need. <laughs> so I have O O R A for orange on this one. Uh -huh. But I, but I braille my tubes so so that I know what I'm starting with. Um, and then and then in my in my artwork, a lot of times I'll, I'll, work, I'll incorporate braille into the the artwork itself. But also the the very the very tactile nature of braille was a huge help to me because whenever I was learning braille, at first I I thought I, I thought I thought there was something wrong with me to be because everything felt like the letter A. You know, I couldn't feel the difference between all the dots. And Those I thought, oh, dots my goodness. do feel the same sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, how in the world do, do, do people do this? And then after a while, I, you know, the, the, the gap started getting bigger and bigger between the different dots. And whenever I paint, it's sort of the same way. I, 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 make, I make lines that I can touch and feel. And at first, they had to be giant, thick lines. But as my as my braille reading got better, as as my as my my sense of touch got better, then I, I could actually draw better. So everything kind of went hand in hand. But one of the main things though is just access to information because I can read an article on the internet that was written like 200 years ago, and I, I can read an, a magazine article or or a blog post that was written 10 minutes ago, and I can have access to all of this information, which means that I can start come coming up with different techniques. Um, and, I'm not, and I'm not limited by what other people think that I should read. You know, uh, it's yeah. not, 
so is it's so just it's true. just it makes things explode and it, and it, it really bridges that gap that I think that what used to be for people with visual impairments, you know, where, where, where you can only get what books that people would, would, I don't know, braille for you or make, you know, available. Now our access is just off the chart. It's just crazy. Well, I know a lot of people have, have heard about, you know, Monet and the fact that he had cataracts later in his life. And how that impacted his, you know, he didn't lose all of his vision, but it changed his perception of the colors. And that's when he went into the phase of his paintings that so many people relate to the watercolors and the, the muted colors, the pastels that, that he was so noted for. And that was because of, of his cataracts. And, you know, he adapted because I'm sure initially he, you know, at first he didn't realize that he was losing or his vision or his vision was changing, but he certainly did amazing work as well. But, you know, you touched on um, some of the tools that you use and some of the strategies, you know, the lines that help you keep oriented to your canvas and um, the tubes to mix your paints. So tell us a little bit more about, you know, do you use a paintbrush? Do you use just the tubes, you know, what kind of tools do you use to, to make your creation on your canvas? Oh, sure, sure. And I love, I love that you brought up Monet. I just wanted to add something really quick to uh -huh. that because I think, I think visually impaired people, um, we need, we need, we need more people who are blind and visually impaired in the arts. We need them. We need, we need their vision. We need their creativity and their voice. And, and it, it's so wonderful with Monet too, because when his, when his vision started to change, he started to, to think about color in different ways. And then he actually had a lens removed and then he started seeing, being able to see in the UV spectrum a little bit. And he completely thought like his a whole idea, a concept of what color meant. So people changed and he would start taking a little pot of paints into the museum because well, they already started showing some of his work in museums. And he would start correcting his old paintings. He would start putting in new, new colors until finally they, 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 they actually had to bar him from the museum and say, oh, no, Claude, you can't come in anymore. But I always thought that was funny. But, but, it's, but having a different vision in art is a huge asset. It can be because everything about art is, is thinking outside of the box. And who is going to think more outside the box than a non-visual visual artist? So, you know, I really encourage people, you know, get in, you know, get creative, get, you know, um, but about the techniques, that's, um, that's mm -hmm. all. Um, the tools and the techniques you use. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I use a lot of different things. I have racks and racks of, of mediums and different um I'm always, I'm always experimenting. It's like a, it's like a, it's, it's like a, a mad lab in here. Um, but, but one of my favorite techniques is to actually make the colors feel different. So I can braille the tube. So like on my orange, for instance, I can read that it says orange. So I know I'm starting with that, but let's say I want an orange that's maybe half as light as what it's what's in the tube. Um, I can mix a medium I could do, uh, into my white paint to make it feel like toothpaste. And a medium is just something that that's that you add into paint that makes it feel different. So, um, and you can buy them at the store. So I'll get a medium and it makes the white feel like toothpaste. And then I'll mix a different medium into my orange and maybe it makes it feel more kind of like runny and, and real like water or like oil or something. So if I want an orange halfway between that white and the orange that I'm starting with, I just mix it for a texture that's halfway between the two. But it gives me a way to be able to control the color. And I'm just using my sense of touch. And at first, that might sound kind of difficult, kind of hard, but I, I teach a workshop and I do this with sighted people that have never had any orientation mobility and I'll blindfold them. And in five or 10 minutes, they're, they're, they're painting a little, little, little cartoon character because you can feel the lines that, that are drawn there um, and, and you can feel the difference between the colors. You can feel, well, white's really thick. That's a thick paint. Well, that's got to be the white. It's the only one that's really thick like that. And if one's really runny, well, that's got to be the orange because that's the only one that feels like that. So it just makes an intuitive sort of sense. And, um, and it's interesting to listen to sighted people, sighted adults particularly, because kids are all in from the very, very beginning. But <laughs> it's interesting here, the sighted adults, because about five minutes in, they go like, oh, like it clicks in their mind. Like, oh, I can understand by using my sense of touch, how to, how to navigate a little bit, how to get around, how to. So, um, so the big thing that I use is just, uh, is just trying to change the way the paints feel. Um, and that, and that's really the, the, the big thing. Like, I don't, I don't use 
any expensive tools. I don't use any crazy techniques. It's something that anybody can learn. There's nothing really special about any of that. Anybody can do this. And that's one of the wonderful things about it is that um, it's not expensive. You're basically using your cane skills. One of, the, one of the benefits of this is that the more that you paint using this sort of technique, um, the better your, your ability to get around is, the better you use the cane, the better you spatially orient because you're constantly practicing the cane skills while you're painting. Right. That's that's amazing. So would would you just, how would you describe your work? People are probably thinking, is he an abstract painter? Is it, is it, or, or do you do, you know, objects or a little of both, or is it color swirls and imaging and imagination that takes you away in a painting or well, is it all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'll, I'll give you a really confusing term. What, what, what I've heard it described as um, ab abstract real, realism, mm -hmm. because I, I try to paint things the way they actually are, because you know, like I said, when I first started, I wanted people to know that I was still me in here. So if I paint somebody's face, I will, you know, I have techniques to be able to fill a person's face and to break it down, just, just the same way that a painter would break down a composition. I'll, 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 I'll treat a person's face like it's a composition. And there's little, there's little tips and tricks. And, and I can teach anybody how to do it. It's not that hard. And I teach sighted people how to do it because it makes a really great way to remember what a face looks like too. You never forget it. And, um, but so I'll, I'll try to paint it the way, the way they look. But when I was a sighted artist, it was really important to me that, that, that what I was drawing or what I was working on actually looked like the subject matter. And if it did, I would think, oh, that's a good piece of art. It looks just like it. After I lost my eyesight, it became more important. I wanted, I wanted it to look like the thing or the person, but it became even more important that it felt like them. You know, it had that emotional quality because, you know, if, if, a, if a person, like if a family member walked into the room and you're in a room full of people, everybody would see your family member. Everybody would see like their haircut, what they look like, what clothes they're wearing. They, they would get all the same visual information. And yet everybody might have a different idea of what that person's actually like. Are they friendly? Do they want to be friends with them? You know, they, are they off-putting? You know, or what, you know, and I thought that's really interesting. Perception is different than just vision. So with my artwork, I, I use color to try to convey emotion and feeling. So, so for me, color isn't real, necessarily a realistic sort of thing. Um, I paint a lot of people with blue and green. And, you know, and, and I know it's not Star Trek. There's not really green, blue people walking around. Yeah. But um, in my paintings, there's pink, blue people with purple and, and all this. But because emotionally, to me, that's what it feels like. So I, I, hope, well, I hope that makes sense. I, I Well, I think it makes sense because well, good. You know, I, I've done a lot of work with museums and and I'm I'm pretty, I, I have to say, you know, I'm not a, um, a mocha kind of you know, modern art type person, mm -hmm. because when I look at something, a sculpture, I spend my time thinking, what is this? I want to know what it is. And when you look at modern art, you know, the curator will say, it's whatever you want it to be. And I'm like, no, I want it to be something. I want to figure out what it is so that I made that connection with the piece. And it is what it is. And so I, I much prefer going to the museum where I can actually look at things that are, you know, that where I have a chance of figuring out it's a person standing in a forest with snow falling or something, you know, and oh, it Kim, just, that's that really, makes yeah. me happy. You know, that yeah. makes me happy. I figured it out. I made a connection with the artist. I mm -hmm. get it. I see the message here. Abstract art, you know, I'm trying to connect and there's just no connecting happening. You know? so, yeah, so Kim, I'm, I'm so glad you said that. That's that's so brilliant. I feel the same way. <laughs> I, like, I like some abstract art. Some of it's amazing, but most of it in, in some modern art, I just don't, you know, and, and but I, I feel like if you go into a gallery and a museum and you say that, that, it, that everybody kind of looks down on. <laughs> and I, I think that's wrong because good art is what is what you like. If you like it, that's good art. If you don't like it, that's, you know, then that art just isn't for you. I won't say it's bad art, but, you know, it's not for you. But so, uh, you know, everybody has their own taste and that's that's what makes art brilliant, you know, and I'm the same way, though. It's hard for me to connect with some of the modern pieces. Like if they take a banana and they duct tape it to a wall, I go like, well, that doesn't really say a lot to me. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's, um, it just is pretty incredible. I, you know, and I understand 
the other part of what you were saying about, you know, wanting to have that element of reality and, and connecting in your paintings, because, you know, the, the book I wrote about drawing with your Perkins Brailler, that's kind of my art, mm. which is nothing compared to your art, I have to say. Oh. Mine is using a Perkins Brailler and I come up with patterns. I often joke and say my book is like, you know, paint by the numbers. You follow the steps and what you'll make at the end is using braille to do, you know, a two-dimensional picture of, of a dog or a cat or an elephant. So it's those kinds of pictures, but people love to make my braille pictures and it really connects them and takes them to, you know, either their childhood or being an artistic person inside and having a vehicle for bringing that back out of them, you know, and they didn't think they could do that. And showing somebody who cited one of your braille pictures makes people incredibly happy. So, yes. oh my goodness. I, oh my goodness. That, that is, that is so brilliant. And it's a tactile sort of art and that's absolutely. Yeah. That's, so that is awesome. Um, but you know, and, and you said it before art is, you know, it's, it's inside all of us and how we can come up with ways to, to bring it out, whether it's craft and knitting and crochet or woodworking. There are so many talented blind artisans out there who are just doing amazing work. And oh my goodness, it is, you know, and, you know, and you, you were saying that, that you, you felt that, that the artwork that you were doing wasn't what wasn't, I don't know, I, I forget the word, but like, <laughs> but you know, not as good as what I was doing. Um, and I, I would have to, 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 to disagree. And I, and, and I, kind and, of you. <laughs> uh, the, well, you know, I, to be honest, like the, the best thing about art to me is, is the act of doing it is, is a creating, like you're in the moment and you're creating. And, and it's, it's my, the, my favorite painting is always the one that I'm working on because it's the one that's helping me. It's the one that's making me feel better that day. And it's the one that, you know, that I'm not, I'm not thinking about my problems and, and, and it could be that I'm working on a new technique and it's an awful, awful painting, you know, like, you know, let's speak. I have a thing called the rack of shame over there in the side of my, my studio. And it's called the rack of shame for a reason. There's a lot of paintings that don't turn out, yeah. but I love those paintings. So I learned something from them. And while I was working on the painting, I still got all the benefits from it. I still love working on it. Maybe the painting didn't turn out at the end. Maybe, maybe it's not as sophisticated as some other painting that I did, but I still got all the reward out of it, you know, and, and, and that's, that's I, to, to me, that's what really, really matters, you know, and if, if you like so something. What is an know, average day in, in your life like? I mean, assuming that you're not on the road or, or at a museum, but when you're at home, what is an average day like? How much time do you spend in the studio painting? Um, well, about about eight, eight, eight to 10 hours, seven days a week, I usually mm -hmm. spend painting. Um, and, and I usually, I used to spend more, but um, I have a son. And so, so I'll, I'll paint late in at night, you know, so I can spend time, you know, you know, spend a good three or four hours. I, I, I cook dinner for, for my family. And so I can hang out with him after school and do different things. Things, things are about to change though, because I'm about to open a gallery in, in Denton oh and it's going to be an all inclusive art space for anybody to come in and paint and work on things, DIY, craft, knit, whatever they want to do and get, get coffee, get other drinks and stuff so they can, and have a gallery space. And I want to, feature art artists with, with disabilities mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's a studio space where I'll be working and so everything's going to change pretty quickly like it's going to open next year and um so I'll be spending a lot of hours up there and um but I, I just want a place that that is completely warm and, and welcome where anybody can come in and and um, whether you're you're a visual impairment whether you don't have a disability everybody's together and everybody can experience art well, that is amazing. You have to keep us posted on, on developments, but congratulations to you. I think that is um, amazing. So well, thank before, you. before we go any further, I'm sure that some of our listeners today might have some questions that they want to ask you. So let's turn back to Dina and see if we can, um, we can hear some of the questions from the audience. Absolutely. We've been getting a lot of questions as you two have been talking. It's been already such a really wonderful conversation. I'm glad I was on mute because I was laughing a lot throughout <laughs> this conversation. <laughs> um, one question that we had, John, is, you know, you 
You mentioned that you've always loved art. It's always been a huge part of your life. I think that's true for a lot of people. Um, how do you take that love for art and turn it into the way you make your living? Do you have any advice for folks on that? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, uh, make, may, making a living as an artist to me still sounds like a crazy idea, but, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. You're doing but, it. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, I, I, feel, I feel very fortunate. But, but I think though that um, um, people are wanting to be more inclusive. Museums are wanting to be more inclusive. And, and one of the things that really helped me was that I started working with museums really early on. So a lot of times museums are, are wanting to do workshops and they're wanting to be um, to have to have have speakers that will come and talk about art. And, 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 and so for for me, that 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 really helped because it I was able to go to these different museums and, and do workshops and different things and do and do and do late nights where they just want artists there just working on their stuff. So I would go up there and then and then on your resume. You know, if you, you know, if you're just painting live there, you're in a hallway and, you know, during a, one of their meet and greet nights, you're just talking to people while, while you're working on something. And so for me, that was really easy. But then on your resume, you've got like, oh, hey, I, 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 um, I, I, I did something at the Met or I did something at the DMA. And, you know, and, and, and the galleries will look at that and go like, ooh, really? <laughs> fancy. <laughs> you're like, yeah, well, it wasn't that fancy, really, to be honest. <laughs> so it, it sounds like you know, we sort of have an idea of an artist as a creator of a specific product, right? So, so you are a painter. You also, though, mentioned workshops, you mentioned speaking engagements. So being able to take sort of a broader perspective on the thing you love, like with that? Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 oh, oh and, and another thing, it's working with, with nonprofits and charities. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a huge thing. And it's, it, it could be incredible because I didn't know this going into it. I, I wasn't smart enough. I don't know. I didn't even think about it, but whenever you work at a, with, with a gallery, um, the idea, the gallery's job is to, is to put your name out there is to, is to maybe is to bring in people that might be interested in art. Um, whenever you work, like whenever you go to a gala or you, or you work with a nonprofit or charity, um, you're maybe painting live or you're, or they're auctioning off some of your artwork, but they're putting your name out there in front of people that, you know, that, that, that might want to collect artwork. So they're doing the same sort of thing. But mm -hmm. the benefit is, is that if I'm working with a gallery and I'm doing like a live painting for them or something, that's great. You know, that's good. You know, it's like, yay me, you know, but, but if I'm doing it with a nonprofit, then every brushstroke means more like, you know, you feel better doing it. And if, if you, if you get a sale, it means that much more because you just help raise money for, for a cause that you feel really strongly about. So not only are you helping your artwork, but you're also helping yourself. Um, and if you don't get any sales or whatever, you still had a great time and you still helped a cause. And, and, and for me, that, 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 that was a huge thing. So um, working with nonprofits and charities can, can be a wonderful avenue and, and with the museums as well, because, um, a lot of artists don't think that about even approaching a museum or going in there, but they have programs where they're just like, they really want to talk to artists. They would love that. Yeah. So, so sometimes it can be like a back door into the art world and, um, and murals. When I started doing murals that, that, that raised some attention. And, um, um, and like in 2017, I think I, I became the first blind person to do, to start doing murals, which was yeah. a shock to me. Cause I figured people did it before, but apparently not. And, um, <laughs> But the wonderful thing about that, though, is like I'm, I'm about to do a mural for a children's hospital and that helps get your name out there. But it also spreads disability awareness in a very mm -hmm. positive sort of way. And which is a wonderful thing about art is that, you know, whenever whenever you talk about blindness, whenever you talk about disability, it's very upbeat. It's very, you know, happy. And it's like, you know, just because you lost your eyesight doesn't mean it has to be a dreary sort of world that that you can't do anything. And so yeah. I don't I love I love doing all this. Um, just being out there and just saying yes to, you know, as much as you can, I think really, really helps. Great. So it sounds like you've had to have uh, an equal passion for sort of the art you're producing and maybe sort of you've also tied that to a mission that's important to you. So that sort of keeps you moving forward through the periods where uh, maybe there isn't as much, you know, work coming in. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, and one 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 of the wonderful things about artwork is that, and the reason that I paint so much every day is because it's therapy. It makes me feel better. So if I am stressed or if I'm feeling bad, I paint. 
if I'm feeling good, I paint, you know, so, yeah. and, um, and my wife, I think, um, I think it makes a difference because if I haven't painted for a little while, my, my wife will say, hey, you should go paint. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, well, thank you for, for that really thoughtful answer. Uh, another question we had from one of our attendees is, do you do other forms of art besides painting? I noticed there is a guitar behind you. I'm wondering if you are a musician as well as a painter. No, <laughs> I, no one, no one, no one would ever want to hear me sing or try to play. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll play the, the ukulele a little bit, but I'm pretty much a one trick pony. I can, I can paint for some reason with my brain. That makes sense. Everything else in the world doesn't make any sense to me, <laughs> but it's a challenge. But, um, but, but, but artwork, it, it makes some kind of sense to me, but, mm -hmm. but I love music in my studio. Um, whenever I hear music, I see color. So I use a lot of music in my paintings. Um, so I love music and I, and I have the guitars because I was trying to understand music a little better, music theory and things like that, but, um, but I'm not good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think for many people, the same way you feel about painting, right? The, it's the act of doing it that's important. I think for a lot of people, uh, that's what music is, right? Uh, so whether you're good or not might be uh, irrelevant. It's, it's the process. Uh, thank and, you. and I, thank you. you know, I like that. <laughs> and, and there does seem to be a lot of, dare I say, like rock and roll vibe in a lot of your artwork, like whether it's literally artwork about musicians or just across, I think your catalog, it's that sort of, it feels like sort of a rock and roll aesthetic. Um, to well, your thank, work, thank if, you. that, if that means anything, I don't know. If yeah, that, that sounds awesome, man. I want to want to quote you exactly, <laughs> especially since you own one of his paintings. I think that's a really good um, analogy. So yeah, really it, it does feel like if if like a the rock and roll aesthetic was applied to R two D two, that's what's hanging on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, another question that we had come in is, um, and I think I'm going to tie it back to this idea. You mentioned the rack of shame, um, mm -hmm. and you talked about it so beautifully. the The actual question was, do you have any advice for pushing through challenges? And I feel like maybe the rack of shame is sort of symbolic of that. So, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um... Um, I think as an artist and as a, as a person, you need, you need to fail and you need to, you know, and if you're not failing in life a little bit from, 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 from time to time, you may not be trying enough new, new things, you know, cause, cause all, all, you know, if you fail, at least it means you're, you're mixing it up a bit. You're, you're trying something, you're not staying static and, 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 and that's, that's perfectly okay. That's, that's the only time it's really a failure is if you don't, you know, if you just stop, you know, but like with, with artwork, it's taught, it's taught me a lot about failure. <laughs> it's funny, but, it, but, it, but I actually get excited whenever I make a mistake, whenever a painting doesn't turn out, because I know I just learned something and, and I get, I get kind of happy. So when a painting doesn't turn out, I'm happy. When it does turn out, I'm happy. Um, but you know, it, it's, 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 it's crazy though, but you know, every painting I'm trying to do new, new things and I always know that there's the opportunity for failure. Um, that's the reason I started doing murals. I, I was, contacted by an international um, team that that wanted to do, um, want to support um, site, site savers um, like day and a national site savers awareness day or I swear my brain is terrible with names and things. Um, and they asked if I could do a mural and, and they're like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, heck, heck yeah, I could do a mural. And then um, they said, well, yeah, we'll do, we'll, we'll, we want to fly you to New York and you're going to do, an, you'll, you'll do a mural up there. And and then I got off the phone. And I thought, what the heck did I just do? I don't know. I don't know how to do a mural. Like, I don't, you know, I, I have to touch everything. How am I going to do a giant wall? And, yeah. but I thought, man, you know, I'm always telling kids in the workshops I do that you got to be okay with failing. And, um, and I thought, you know, what a, you know, it's a good challenge. So I, I don't know. It's, yeah. I you know, a lot of times I think we get down on ourselves, you know, but you just, it's okay. It's okay to, it's okay to be failing a little bit. It's a, it's actually a very positive thing. It really can be because I think if you don't, you know, it's it's the the flip side of the coin is if you're not failing, then you're not stepping outside your comfort zone to try something new and you've gotten complacent or really comfortable sort of day in, day out. And but yet you're feeling like life is kind of humdrum. I don't have something new. So it's it's taking all of that together and stepping outside your comfort zone and doing something new and trying something new 
um, to get the benefit of it. And if it doesn't work out, that's not a bad thing. It, you tried. And that's what's so important, I think. Oh, Kim. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. That's. Yep. I, I also think that's such a great analogy for our participants in career launch who are certainly going to be, um, you know, going through multiple job interviews and just having the, and being able to embrace the idea that there is something you can learn from every opportunity, whether it goes the way you want or not, yeah. I think is really important. And, and as new employees, when they, when they do land their job, they are going to be in situations where you're gonna have to keep trying and trying and trying. And so knowing that there's value in all of that, even, you know, again, what we would consider failure is actually, you know, an opportunity to learn. Um, it's it's so, a growth experience. Yeah. yeah. It, hopefully it can be looked at as a growth experience rather than a failure. Mm -hmm. you you know, and, from it, so. Yeah. And, it, and it's okay to, to be nice to yourself too. I should say like a lot of times pe people who are creative, are, are the nicest people to other people. Like they're you know, the sweetest, nicest people. But when it comes to themselves, a lot of times they're they're so judge, judgmental with themselves, <laughs> you know, and they're so harsh with, with yourself. If you make a mistake, you think, you know, I don't, I don't know. It, they would never treat another person the way that they, they treat themselves. So, so important to, to give yourself time, you know, let yourself fall on your face a little bit because you will pick yourself up. You will figure it out. You know, you'll, you'll make it better the next time. You know, if not then, then the next time. It's just, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, again, really great advice for folks who are sort of in that, that part of their lives that is transition, right, where every day is an opportunity for something new. Uh, I'm wondering, as we're nearing the end of the, the time we have today, um, if maybe you have some general advice for folks who are in that period of their lives where they're learning new skills every day, and they're uh, putting themselves out there in, in new ways. You talked a little bit earlier about um, that that part of your life when you were balancing learning new blindness skills with also being a student. And and I'm just wondering if you have any general advice for folks on how to how to handle it all, how to move through it. <laughs> well, um, I, I would say that um, whenever I first lost my eyesight, and you know, and, and I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. It was awful. It was terrible. I was really scared. I felt very isolated. I felt, even though I had people all around me, I, I still felt isolated and alone. I almost felt like a ghost. Like, like I didn't have any power around anything around me. You know, like I couldn't make changes or, and no matter how much I raged or anything, it didn't have any effect. Like there's nothing that I could do. I didn't feel like I could, I could make any, <laughs> anything new in my life. And, and I was just very depressed and angry. And, um, I was really fortunate to have people around me that believed in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. And, and I just followed their advice and, and I, I, I did the things that they said to do, you know, I started learning the O&M and, and, and doing it all. But on the inside, I didn't feel any different. You know, to be honest, I, I learned how to travel with a cane. I learned how to, how to cook without, you know, how to eat without getting food all over myself. You usually, you know, things like that. But, I, but it still wasn't changing. I still didn't have any hope. And then with artwork in my life, it, it helped it helped change my mentality because I started to, you know, to live more in the moment and it gave me, it, it made me slow down a little bit. You know, it gave, it gave me a time to heal and, and, and really just to slow down and, and to give myself a chance to, to not be down on myself all the time and to be, you know, just hurting. And, I almost felt like there had been a death in the family, you know, be like, because this future me that, that I had this idea of what I was going to do and, and, and who I was going to be was gone. They was like, it was like, it was like the, you know, it was like somebody that I knew and they had passed away and I was mourning that. And it takes time to, to get over that. It takes time to mourn and you've got to give yourself the time and things will get better, you know? And because once, once you've adapted, once you've learned different ways to do things, then you've learned it. You, you know, it's done. Like you're done. You're, you're, you've adapted. And, and we forget how hard it was when we were growing up to learn how to walk, how to read, how to do everything, you know, because we did it, we took time. We had years to learn this sort of stuff. And then suddenly, you know, something may happen and all of that's thrust on you at once. And you feel like you're going to be letting your family down. You feel like you've got to, 
you know, you got to pay some bills, you're going to do all these different things, you're wondering how in the world am I going to make all this happen? And it just feels like you have the weight of the world on yourself, but it just takes time. And like, you know, for instance, like I have a guide dog named, named Eagle. She's a sweetheart. Um, she's my, you know, she's brilliant, but I had to learn cane training and I learned how to tra and travel independently. And then like, but with Eagle, like when I'm out and about, I have my smartphone, I have her. If I'm in a restaurant that I've never been in a city that I've never been, I can ask Eagle to find the boys. And she knows the difference between a men's bathroom and a lady's bathroom. So, so she'll find it in the restaurant in there. She knows the difference between a urinal, a stall. She can find the sink for me, a trash can, you know, and then she'll remember where it was I was sitting, you know, and then, wow. and then I, I have the techniques to be able to cross the street when I get outside. I have, you know, I, yeah. I can ask my phone where a cup of coffee is, like where's a coffee place. It'll give me directions. Of course you can do this with a cane too. Um, Eagle just makes it so I can be lazy and uh, which is brilliant, <laughs> which I'm a big fan of. And, um, but you know, but the point is like you, you, you adapt to it. And to me, that's normal. Like I, I used to dream where I was sighted after I lost my eyesight for a while. And then, and then I started using my cane in my dreams. Mm -hmm. And now a lot of times I'm, I'm traveling with it with Eagle, you know, and yeah. you adapt and it just becomes normal. And I, and I will say I'm happier now than I've ever been at any time in my life, whether it's sighted or not. I have so many incredible people around me and I'm able to do something that I love and I'm able to like talk like right now with, with you, Dina and you, Kim, and, and all everybody listening. And the whole reason I got into art was to connect with people and I never thought it would work, but here I am and I'm, 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 I'm living my dream. So, you know, what do I have to complain about? <laughs> exactly. Well, you, do sound, like you do sound happy and you sound fulfilled and, you know, I have enjoyed the last hour so much just getting, I feel like I have a new friend and I, I hope I do. Um, oh, yes, it's yes. been great to talk with you and tell us how our listeners can kind of keep, keep up with you. Um, Deanne, Dina mentioned the, um, that you had a catalog or is there a website or any way that that our listeners can learn more about your work and kind of keep track of you and your studio opening and all the great things that are coming down the road for you. Oh, well, well, well thank you. And I, I would like to encourage anybody, if you have a question that you didn't get answered and you want it answered, please just send me an email, Facebook me or whatever, and I, I'll get back to you and I'll try to answer it as well as I can. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, my, my email is bramblet at gmail.com. Um, everything is bramblet for me. It's my last name. Mm -hmm. So bramblet on Facebook. Um, and I do a live Facebook stream every week. Um, I do it from the studio and I usually give away some art and we, um, and we'll play games and, and I'm painting and which is a great time because if someone says, Oh, what, well, what medium do you use? Or what do you use for this or that? I can show you and I can answer questions live, which is really nice. And, um, but on Instagram, it's Bramblet and uh -huh. Twitter. I never go on Twitter. I need to get on Twitter more, but, um, but it's Bramblet. And um, if you forget my name, if you type blind, blind painter and in the internet, I'll pop up. I bet. <laughs> I'm I like bet. a bad penny. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself and your art um, with all of us today. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed it as well. It was a really great contribution to our speaker series and um, we'll make sure you get a, a, a copy of the recording as well. well thank you. And, and Kim and, and Dina, I felt, I felt, I felt, I feel like I made two, two new friends as well. So, uh, so please sit, stay in touch. Absolutely. John, this was such a joy. Kim, thank you so much for facilitating an incredible conversation. Thank you to everyone who tuned in today. There will be a recording available. We'll send it out to everyone. Um, and it'll also be available uh, through the Perkins website. Um, definitely follow John on Instagram. It is very entertaining. Uh, and uh, thank you again for coming today. Oh, thanks so much, guys. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.